morning, everyone. Um, good to see everybody here. Um, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, dinner's actually 7.30 this evening. I'll tell you more about it um, during the lab session this afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to say we've got Ben Shipway from the Met Office uh, come to talk to us about next generation modeling with Alfred. So. Thank you, Luke. Can you hear me all right at the back? Brilliant. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, I'm Ben Shipway uh, from the Met Office, from the Dynamics Research team there. Uh, so my name is up here because I'm presenting today, but the work that's gone into this is a cast of thousands, um, so many at the Met Office. Um, and in fact, the Met Office logo is at the top, but there should also be uh, some reference to SDFC and NERC as well, who were very uh, worked very closely with us in the initial development of Gung-Ho uh, Gung project, which started around about 10 years ago, a little over now, developing our, our new uh, ideas for our new model and dynamical core. Um, so the, the lecture this morning is going to be about our next generation modeling uh, systems, um, and in particular the atmosphere model. Um, I will start off by talking a bit about our current generation modeling. So these are the things that you're probably looking at using in the tutorials this week. So the UM, um, and that has what we call the end game dynamical core, um, which has been operational since about 2012 and is our current operational model. Um, and then I'll go on to just, after describing that, just say why do we need a next generation model? What's the reason for us doing that? Um, and it's a very clear reason that you'll, I'll hopefully explain to you. Um, the, uh, the next sort of section of, we'll actually go into some of the details of what, sh what, what the next generation model is. And so what we're talking about here is the model called Elfric. Uh, that's named after Lewis Fry Richardson. Um, and the, the dynamical core in Elfric is called Gung Ho, which has a, a backronym, but uh, typically... Uh, we just call it gung-ho these days. If you want to know what it is, it's a globally uniform, uh, next generation, highly optimized dynamical core. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail showing you some of the code there, because it's not just the science, really, that's, that's changing in all of this. It's also how we implement things in the code. And then if there's time, I'll just give you uh, an overview of some of the, the, the current status with the, with the model where we are and when we expect the, the whole system to be ready. So just to, to, to start us off in our current modeling systems, this is a, a, have I got the pointer? Can you see that? Yes. So this is a, a sort of diagram of the various different configurations, model config configurations that we use operationally at the UM, at, at the Met Office. So these are global models um, that I've highlighted in the, in the brackets. And for deterministic numerical weather prediction, we run uh, with horizontal resolutions of around about 10 kilometers uh, measured at mid-latitudes. Um, that's coarse and slightly when we run in an ensemble system. So we run large numbers on, of ensembles at 20 kilometer resolution. But then as we go down uh, across the forecast lead times, so looking at long lead times, climate scenarios, etc then we get coarser resolution. So we need our model to run between a global model to run at both 10 kilometer resolution and down at 140 kilometers. It's not just seamless in the climate and NWP sense though, so it's seamless in the sense that we also run a regional model. Um, so a regional model is uh, a, a limited area domain, such as this one uh, highlighted over London. Um, where boundary conditions are supplied by the global model. But these are then run at much higher resolution than the, the global is typically. So over the UK, the whole of the UK domain, we typically run a one and a half kilometer resolution model. Uh, but we can go right down to about 300 meters. And again, we're using the same underlying science for all of this. So the same dynamical core, um, the same physics by and large. Uh, perhaps I'll just briefly highlight actually that all of these, the, these models here, going from the, the NWP high resolution to the, the coarse resolution climate, 
all use pretty much exactly the same dynamical core and physics settings. Um, they even use the same coupling to the ocean these days as well. So we have a coupled ocean forecast model. Um, obviously, there are other things that come in, such as aerosols and chemistry at the, the climate scale, but pretty much most of the physical atmosphere is identical between the climate and the NWP system. So just very briefly then, so the, these, these very high resolution NWP um, problems, they are really what's driving us with gung-ho and uh, uh, a next generation science because it, they reach the limit of our strong scaling. And I'll explain that a little bit in a minute, but uh, <coughs> as we get higher and higher resolution, we've got more and more grid points we need to get things through the system. And I should, should have pointed out, actually, that for, for all of these NWP configurations, these model forecasts need to complete within an hour. So there's a, there's a time pressure on how quickly we get the throughput of these model simulations. But then at the global low resolution, um, the dynamic core is actually a smaller proportion of the overall cost of the model. It's, there's more of a cost from chemistry and aerosols, for example. Um, but the long time integrations motivate us to have equation sets that uh, are both accurate um, on the short time scales, but on the longer time scales, which is more important for climate change, for, so in terms of things like conservation properties, uh, we don't want systematic biases, so we don't want to uh, remove uh, or approximate the equations in such a way. So that gives us a different driver in how we formulate the model. And again, thinking about the high resolution the very high resolution NWP, so the, 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 where our scale is getting towards a kilometer, that also changes our scientific description of the model. So we, want, we need to think about how we're describing the very short scales in here, and that motivates us, us to have a, a non-hydrostatic equation set. But we want to have the same equation set for all of these seamless applications. Um, so this is a little bit of... Uh, uh, what would normally be showing off, but in this case, it's more motivation. So, so this is a, an example of um, uh, our NWP skill, how we measure how good our model is compared to other models. And these lines are all the relative uh, skill of other uh, NWP centers compared to the UM, where things above the blue line are worse and things below are better. And pretty much we sit ahead of all of these operational centers um, that the European center is generally a bit better than us. That's NWP. In terms of climate, again, these are all very difficult to, to, to measure the skill of these things. But, but we can have a look. And I, I'm no, no expert in these metrics at all. But in general, blue is good on this plot and red is, is bad. And I don't know if you can see it, but these are the, the UM uh, models here, and there's a lot of blue on these things. So we have good climate skill in our unified model. So why not stick with what we've got? Why do we need to have a new generation? So. What's the science that we've got here going on? <clears throat> this is our governing set of equations. So in our physical model, we have prognostic equations for momentum, uh, for thermodynamics. So let me just explain. So the, the momentum here, this is a, a three-dimensional wind vector, U. Thermodynamic equation, this is a potential temperature um, variable. We then have the continuity equation, so this is dry density, this row here. Um, and then we have moisture transport. So in, uh, in everything that we'll be talking about, we'll be thinking about mixing ratios uh, for each different species provides you with the, the, the prognostic variable for moisture. And this would be true also of chemi chemical traces as well. Um, and then finally, we, we tile this up with an equation of states where here, uh, exner pressure here, pi, um, is, our, is our pressure variable. And you'll see this up here as well back in the momentum equation. 
So broadly speaking, we've got a lot of terms here that uh, provide us with what we might think of wave motion, so things that are, are quite wavy. We've got a, a Coriolis terms. We have a geopotential term here. So it's worth noting that we don't have this as a fixed gravity. It's, it, it varies with the radius uh, away from the Earth. Um, and then you have your pressure contribution and your thermal uh, buoyancy terms. And these are all interacting through these advection terms. Um, if we look at those separately, it's worthwhile highlighting. So these are what we could call transport terms. So these are effectively the wind moving stuff around. Um, and we will think about these slightly differently to other terms a bit later on. The terms on the right-hand side, so typically though all of these things on the left-hand side are treated by the dynamical core, so the, the continuous equations of motion. Um, uh, or what we're resolving, sorry. Whereas these terms on the right represent subgrid forcings, and these are pretty much uh, exclusively physical parameterizations. So, for example, for the, the momentum, we might have a, a boundary layer drag term. Um, for the thermodynamics, uh, we might have uh, a heating from latent heat release um, and, or radiation from uh, radiative fluxes. And then for the moisture uh, equation, then obviously we've got things like clouds forming, rain falling out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's also worthwhile just highlighting here, because it's often overlooked, that moisture appears not just as a as a passive tracer, but it also comes into this pressure term up here. So moisture uh, is represented in terms of a, a pressure force, so the the, the vapor but it also acts as a, a weight. Uh, so the, the rain, hail, etc., acts as a weight on the fluid. That's not true of any of the uh, aerosols in chemistry in general, uh, in our model, that is to say. Um, these terms become more and more re relevant when you get higher and higher resolution. So if we go to very high resolutions where we're resolving bubbles, clouds, etc., we can have quite high hydrometeor contents which weigh down on the cloud more than if you've got a very coarse resolution model where there's very little in the way of, of uh, hydrometeor loading. Right. So the way we start to break these equations, continuous equations down into something that we can actually uh, put into a computer is that we have a, a currently, our current modeling system runs with a latitude longitude grid. Um, and in the horizontal, and then in the vertical, we have a, a, a terrain following coordinate. Uh, this terrain following coordinate gradually uh, sees a less of an influence of the surface as you get higher and higher until about 17 kilometers. It's pretty much a, a spherical shell again. <clears throat> now, this, this latitude longitude grid is obviously very uh, convenient uh, for, for various reasons, such as plotting, etc. But it also provides us with a very nice system of orthogonal coordinates. Um, so the, the zonal, meridional winds, etc., sit ne neatly. And when we feed these into our simple uh, finite differences, we get very nice properties of the equations. Um, how do we do those? Well, the spatial discretization that we use in these is uh, typically st staggered. So we use what's called a uh, C-grid staggering in the horizontal. So if these are our lines of latitude and longitude, then we will have a pressure or a density point at the center here. And then we will have our zonal and meridional winds um, offset either side of these. And this is quite nice because it means that if we take the derivatives of the winds, then these, they, they naturally sit at the center of the cells and it means that if we take the divergence of the wind, then that sits where our density lives. Now that's a very nice property to have. We also, in the vertical, have a, um, a, a what's called a Charney Phillips staggering. So rather than having U, V, and W all at the same vertical level, there's a staggering such that the, the vertical winds are offset from the, the, the horizontal. 
and, and more importantly, they're offset from, from density and they're co-located with theta. And this prevents us from getting uh, spurious um, grid length modes that can appear in the vertical if you were to co-locate uh, these things. But there's a, there's a, 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 the downside, of course, is you have to manage this, this staggering in some way. For the transport terms that I highlighted, <coughs> we use a, a semi-Lagrangian uh, method of, uh, of transport. Now, I don't know if, uh, if people have looked at uh, previous um, talks on this, but I believe Nigel Wood gave a talk on, uh, on transport in general, uh, the 2018 um, meeting, and he's got quite some quite nice uh, discussion in that about the various types of transport, so semi-Lagrangian, Eulerian, Lagrangian. So, so very briefly, in a Lagrangian transport system, what we're doing is we're moving with the fluid flow. So we say, if we're sitting in a parcel and we move with the parcel, what happens to it? And if there's no other uh, contributions from um, heating, etc., local source terms, then actually what, what happens at this point here is what happens at our arrival point. So we just look back up the flow and we see, um, we, we say what was, what was happening at this departure point, that's now going to be at our new point when we get to the end of our time step. Um, in an Eulerian approach, what we would be doing is we'd be looking to see uh, at this point here, so at our grid point, what happens as the wind pulls stuff through us. How does stuff change? So as things are coming across, how, how, what's coming in, what's going out, how does the, the whole system change locally at that point? But I, I would refer you to Nigel's talks last year, uh, or 2018, for, for more detail on, on those things. Right, so how do we manage uh, the time step uh, itself? So we have our... Uh, spatial discretization, how do we then march our solution forwards in time? If we were to consider a continuous equation of this form, so much simplified from what I showed previously, but essentially we've got some state vector x, uh, which is varying in time with some forcing on the right-hand side, which is a, a function of, of this state vector, vector at the time t then we could consider writing down an explicit form of this equation in, in when we discretize in time. So what does this mean by explicit? So what we have here is we're saying that our next time level state, uh, the change of that over the time step, so going from our current time step to the next time step, is going to be based on what's happening now. So we have all of the information. We say at the start of the time step, all of our forcing fields look like this. So let's use that to determine what's going to look like in the future. That's great, and that's nice and easy to implement. In an implicit uh, form of the equations, rather than saying uh, the, these terms on the right-hand side are based on what we know now, we say what they're going to be based on what we're going to get at the end of the time step that's harder to implement. But the key thing is, explicit forms are generally unstable unless you have a fairly small time step. Whereas if we use an implicit method, then these are unconditionally stable with respect to the, the time step. So we can use a very large time step to get from our current state to our future state. And that's obviously very good from a point perspective of efficiency computational efficiency, because remember, we've got to get this done within an hour for our forecast. So the implicit methods are very attractive in that sense, but they can also be uh, damping in terms of what the solution looks like. What we actually use in practice, then, is a semi-implicit form of the equations. So what we do is we take some, uh, some weighting factor alpha, and we'll have Part of that uh, state at the end of the time step, or on our right-hand side, and one minus alpha weighted 
from the start of the time step. So if you take alpha equals a half, that's a crank Nicholson scheme. Uh, and so you'd have half of this and half of that. In practice, in what we do at, in, in Endgame and what we're going to be doing in Gung Ho, is we take alpha to be 0.55. So there's a slight off-centering towards this implicit term. But as I say, this is hard to solve now because we need to know the answer before we can write down what, uh, what our forcing terms are on the right-hand side. So this is easily overcome then by using a simple iteration technique. So all we're then going to do is we're going to say our state at our next iteration is based on our state at the previous iteration plus the start of the time step value. So the, the implicit part here is updated with each iteration. And then after we've done k iterations, then we take the, the, the next time step as being this kth iteration. And here, typically, we're looking at having overall four iterations. But I'll explain a little bit more about that in the next slide as well. Um, it's worthwhile, uh, I don't think I've got a slide on this, but, but saying that this is what we do generally for the, the dynamics term. So I think, I think probably what I've called the, um, the wave-like terms on the previous slide. So uh, Coriolis, pressure gradients, etc. Um, transport. For the physics schemes, so the subgrid physics schemes, the terms on the right-hand side, some of those we choose to take to be explicit, and we call those the slow physics, and some of them we take to be implicit, and we call those the fast physics. And the reason for having things in a slow physics is that, well, we don't want to keep evaluating them in this iteration because it's expensive, so we just do them once at the start of the time step. The reason that we might want to do things fast, physics, so we do this implicitly and have to do multiple iterations of them, is that they're very tightly coupled, the time scales are very tightly coupled with the dynamical core, and so we need to make sure we've got a very good estimate uh, in this implicit, semi-implicit process. So, I've got a little diagram here. Hopefully this will work. So this is now thinking about our time step going from left to right. So where the little icon is here is, is our start of the time step. I'm just, so at the bottom here, I'm just keeping a track of the different calls to the different parts. So we have slow physics here. Fast physics is done in here. Uh, what I've called core transport. So this is transport for the things that are important in our system of equations. So the the, the, obviously the winds, the uh, potential temperature, dry density, but also the, the moist mixing ratios. Um, tracer transport are things that don't feed back onto the dynamics because we only need to do those once, once we've got a, uh, a good solution. And then uh, this is the, the linear solver. So once we've got to this point and we've evaluated all our terms on the right-hand side, we need to solve the system of equations that we looked at before. And finally, there's a clouds and chemistry and aerosol, which are done once we've, we've been through all of that process. So first of all, we come into the slow physics. So the slow physics here, we're talking about shortwave radiation and long-grade radiation. Uh, typically, those use a one-hour time step. So if our model time step is shorter than an hour, then we will only call the radiation every two or three, four time steps to update with, a, with an expensive calculation. Uh, conversely, the cloud microphysics is called in here, but that uses a two-minute time step. So if our model time step is longer than two minutes, which it generally is, then the cloud microphysics will be sub-stepped. So it will do its own uh, little iteration, sub-stepping uh, of its own. And we also have the gravity wave drag and explicit boundary layer. We then move into this loop, and we do our advection. Um, for the time being, please ignore the details of those things, because that's, that's uh, next generation rather than current generation. Um, and then we move on to moist convection, 
implicit boundary layer, and cloud condensation. We then pop into this second loop. So I referred to a Picard iteration, but what we do is rather than doing all of the terms in so four iterations of the whole system, what we do is we do two iterations, such as this, that where we start with the transport and fast physics. But in here, we also do two iterations around the Coriolis and other nonlinear terms for the dynamical core itself, where we do a, a linear solve because that makes things uh, more tractable. And then this etera extra iteration picks up some further nonlinear terms. So we do two extra iterations in there. Then we come around again for our second iteration where we do again the transport, now with our updated fields from being through the first loop. And now we will also do the chemical trace of transport. Um, <clears throat> and we do uh, fast physics the second time. Again, we've updated our state from the first iteration. So now we're starting to pick, it, pick up this, the end of time step, uh, best guess. And then we come in here again and overall, we've done four iterations of our solver, but we've only done t the transport twice and the fast physics twice. And then we move on to do our chemistry and aerosol at the end of the time step before heading off onto the next time step and do it all over again. It's quite very complicated but, uh, and costly, but the cost of that complicated system is offset by the fact that we can then use a very long time step compared to the explicit time stepping that we would have done otherwise. And that means that, that, that we can get to our solution in a, in a time that fits into our forecast, wall, uh, forecast uh, window. Um, pretty much m uh, most weather forking, forecasting centers use a semi-implicit uh, time stepping like this. By and large, I think most climate models use an explicit time step but that's, uh, that's a generalization. Right, so why do you want the next generation? Okay. So uh, the story begins at the end game. So end game is, as I mentioned before, our current dynamical core. Uh, I said earlier it became operational in 2012. It's 2014 it became operational. And when it came in, it greatly improved the scalability of the model but probably not enough for exascale. So this, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a, a, a plot uh, that was made uh, way back uh, 10 years ago, I guess, probably something like that, looking at how well uh, end game scales. So what do we mean by scaling to begin with? So when we've got our large problem, what we want to do is throw lots of processes at it um, we want to throw as many at it, at it as we can possibly. This scaling curve tells you how much speed up you get compared to what you might expect if things were perfect. So if things are perfect and you double the number of cores you've got available, then your model should finish tw in twice, half the time. It should be twice as fast. The blue line here is what happens with end game then. So we are still scaling out, so if we give it more cores, we are going faster, but this is leveling off. So at some point, we're going to get to the point where we give it more cores, give it more power, but we won't get anything back from that. It won't get any faster. <clears throat> Does that matter? Well, this is a plot that I, a slide that I've borrowed from. Uh, Chris Maynard actually, so I'm, I'm not uh, by any means uh, familiar with the very details of this, but it, it's a, quite a, a dramatic slide, so I like to include it. But um, this is a, a plot produced by Intel in, in the year 2000. Um, what it's showing, I believe, uh, are the range of chips uh, that it's, it's been developing over time. And by and large, over the last, or before the year 2000, certainly, uh, of the leading up to the year 2000, the Met Office and, and all other uh, science areas have been benefiting from the fact that every couple of years your processes get faster and so you can do more work on those processes and uh, you can throw more resolution at it, uh, you can get better results 
And we just have to wait for the, the processes to get faster for us to do that. But by the time they got to the year 2000, it was forecast that if you wanted to try and keep increasing the power density of your processes, so I, I had a Pentium or 2 gigahertz or something back then, um, if you wanted to keep going with that, 4 gigahertz, 8 gigahertz, whatever it might be, then actually you're going to have to start getting some pretty strange physics going on in your, in your chips, uh, and your power density is just going to be too high to keep the temperatures low. And, and I don't know if you can read some of these things, but the prediction here is that by 2005, you'd need the, the, the power density would be that of a nuclear reactor. Uh, by 2010, it's the, the rocket, a rocket nozzle. So these things just weren't feasible. And certainly, I don't think I've got anything as nearly as powerful like that in my, in my laptop here. But it's still going, we still managed to get things going faster and faster. So have we been doing that? Well, the answer is that rather than having faster chips, we have more of them. So we have more chips. We have more uh, uh, parallel, task parallel, whatever communication that's going on. So part of the model can do one bit. Part of the other model can do another bit. And that relates to the scalability then. So as we keep going, our next supercomputer is not going to have faster chips at all. In fact, they may be slower, but it will have many, many more. And so we need to be able to exploit those. We need a, a model that can scale well. And that really is the, the crux of the motivation for having a next generation model. Right, so wh what's the problem then? If we look at our current global model then, I mentioned that it's a lap long grid. Um, so this, looking at, a bit carefully at this, what this means is that if we have a 25 kilometer resolution model, which is uh, lower than the resolution of our current ensemble, then because things converge towards the poles, we have a singularity at the poles, then the spacing near the poles actually becomes much less than 25 kilometers, but it gets down to 75 meters. So we're putting a huge amount of resolution into the poles, where really we're not that bothered about the solution. Uh, no more there than we are other, other parts of the planet, certainly. At 10 kilometers, which is our current operational model, then the resolution reduces down to 12 meters, which I guess is probably the width of this room, something like that. So if you imagine we've got a global model, we've got grid points that are that far apart, whereas uh, over uh, the UK, we've probably got them uh, 10 kilometers apart, so the width of Cambridge, something like that. So apart from being inefficient at putting uh, information in places we don't want it to be, the key thing here is that, as I mentioned before, we use a semi-Lagrangian transport scheme, but transport in general requires information to pass from one place to another place. And generally, that in, uh, over a, a single time step, that will be much more than 12 meters. It will be several kilometers. And so we have to communicate between all of the grid points around these poles. And when we're doing extra communication, if we're communicating, then we're not doing computation. And that really slows down uh, the model. It reduces the scalability. So if we add in more processors, if, uh, then it means we're going to do more communication the model's going to get slower. And it's, it's because of this issue around the pole. Right. And just to highlight that this is, this is where the problem's coming from, this is a, uh, a plot of the strong scaling of the UM at six kilometer resolution. So going a little bit higher resolution than our current operational. Um, what we have here on the left is a run using 128 nodes. And on the right, it's using 2,048 nodes. So we're giving it a whole lot more resource. And then this is the breakdown in these pie charts of what, what's taking the time. The red, sorry, the uh, orange color here, apologies if you, if you can't make out the colors, but the, uh, the, the orange here is uh, the proportion that's spent in our fast physics. The kind of pink is where the slow physics is. And this blue is where we're in the dynamical core. And this is a breakdown between the transport and 
other parts of the dynamical core. And if you have a look on the right-hand side, this expresses it in terms of the scaling efficiency. So scaling efficiency of one means we give it twice as much stuff, as much uh, processor hardware, and it goes twice as fast. Whereas the scaling efficiency of a half means we're using only half of the pro available processes that we would have done uh, compared to perfect scaling. And it's, it's this line here with the solver, with the transport, that is really starting to drop off. So we know it's the dynamic core that's the issue. As we might expect, because the physics operates locally. It operates in columns, very little communication, so it should scale very well. Right, so this is just a bit of a summary. I, I'll skip on a little bit. Um, except to say a couple of other things. So this is the motivation of having a new dynamical core. One of the other things that we recognized when we were thinking about how to do, solve this problem is actually we didn't know what computer chips were going to look like. So we, we knew they were going to be slower and there were going to be more of them, but we didn't know what they would look like. Would they be CPUs, GPUs, would some other co technology come along? And so what we decided to do at that point was rather than retrofit a new dynamical core into the UM, which would have been an option, we, th we decided we needed to write from scratch a new model with new, with new software that can be performance portable. So what we mean by performance portable is we can take it from one architecture, a CPU, and we can very easily move it onto another architecture, a GPU, or whatever might come along in the future. So we want to kind of future-proof this, um, this model so we don't have to keep rewriting the science every time a new kind of computer architecture comes along. And that's where Elfric originates, um, the idea of Elfric. Okay, um, so how, we, how did we decide to solve this problem? So in the middle is our uh, lat-long grid, which is great. We could... And these are all things that we, we explored in the Gunko project. We could look at something like uh, we have on the left with tri using triangles. Um, we could have something that looks like we have on the right using overset meshes. So this is called a yin-yang mesh. Oh, uh, so the yin-yang mesh is good because we could retain pretty much the end game numerics because it's, it's on a, a lat long mesh, it's just that it doesn't go around the whole globe and then we stick two of them together. But it's not great for thinking about conservation properties and physics in the overlap regions where we have to do something a bit special. So we discounted that one. Triangles is also very attractive. Um, it's potentially though quite difficult when we think about how we're going to couple this to the physics. Um, and other systems, etc. Using triangles isn't something that we're particularly used to, used, used to in the in the UM environment. It's 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 not something that we might be ruled out completely. So, the the Gunko uh, dynamical core that we'll come on to would work with triangles, but it's not something that we want to do right now because we've got so much going on. Uh, we want to minimise change in that respect, uh, so we're not pursuing that at this time. What we have decided to do then is to move to a cubed sphere. So what this is, is we have effectively uh, six panels. Um, if we think about a cube made up of those six panels and we just inflate it, we blow it up, then it looks something like this. And that's the, uh, the new mesh that we're, we're going to be trying to, or we have implemented now. Um, this, has, this was the primary candidate we wanted to try out. It's been working, so it's pretty much baked into what we're doing now. So for all of the other things around uh, visualization, uh, data simulation, things like that, we're pretty much set on this cubed sphere in our next, or our first iteration of our next generation. <clears throat> but the key thing to note here is that we no longer have this convergence at the poles. We have a fairly uniform distribution of resolution around the whole globe. What we do have are these eight special corners where we have to be a little bit careful that we're still getting some good behavior of the solution. Right, how do we make sure that we do get good solutions? So 
as I mentioned before, the, the lat-long grid gives us very nice properties. The way that the orthogonal um, uh, winds uh, give us nice uh, properties in the continuous equations when we, when we glue everything together. If we make our mesh non-orthogonal, which is what we're going to be doing here, so that our, uh, each cell is no longer aligned with the, the coordinates of the lat-long grid, then we need to be careful how we do the numerics such that we don't introduce problems, such we don't have funny features at the corners, such that we retain a lot of the, the good continuous... Um, the, the, uh, the, the numerics that, that represent the continuous reflect the continuous nature of the equations, which we have with endgame. And the way that we've chosen to do that is to use mixed finite, uh, mixed finite elements. So finite elements in general... I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, so have a, have a look at uh, Shipton and Cotter and, and Melvin et al. I'll put some uh, clearer references later on. But what we do here is we represent, within each grid cell now, we represent um, the fields by poly different polynomial representations where we have coefficients determined at different points. So, for example, in this field, which I'm calling W3, there is a single degree of freedom in each three-dimensional cell, which represents a constant value. So we have a constant value throughout that three-dimensional cell. In this cell here, which we call W2, we have a linear variation across the cell. So we have a value at each side, each face, and there's a linear variation assumed between those. Uh, in all three, dim three directions. Um, and similarly, some of these ones down here, you'll have linear variations across the cell edges. Um, uh, and we, we could, if we want to, we could make this not linear, but we could introduce higher order terms. So we could have it that in this space we have a linear variation, and this is quadratic. But the key thing is here, we have all of these different... Um, finite element spaces satisfy this Durham, what's called a Durham complex. So if you take a uh, grad of this, you end up in this space. If you take the curl of this, you end up in this space. If you take the divergence of this, you end up in this space. And so that's reflecting very similar way to what I said before with our grid staggering, that if you take, if you were to put your wind fields in this space, and you take the uh, divergence of, of that wind, then it very naturally falls in the space we call W3. So this is where we put things. So we have our winds in this W2 space. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, things popping up on my sheet, machine, you can't see them directly. Okay. Um, we have density and pressure uh, in this space here. And then we make our new, ourselves our own bespoke space because we like the, the, the staggering we had in the vertical before. So the staggering in the vertical, Charney Phillips staggering, we, uh, we uh, achieve. So we already have the Z, sorry, the W values are staggered like this, but we choose to put theta in that same space just as the vertical part of W2. So we have a linear variation of uh, theta in the vertical but it's constant in the horizontal. And we also put moisture in there because we like moisture to live in the same place as theta. A key, key things here, though, is that because we have a linear variation across the cell, our neighboring cell will pick up the same value as the face and here. So it's, we have a continuous variation. So our winds are, are now considered to be continuation. If we change what's going on in this cell, with this degree of freedom, then that automatically changes what's going on in its neighboring cell. And this is where we call that fully coupled. So it's the same in all three directions. This one is nicely discontinuous. So I can update one cell here without modifying the neighboring cell. It's a discontinuous uh, constant uh, within here and co different constant in its neighboring cell. In our W theta space, it's also discontinuous in the horizontal, but now it's vertically coupled. So we have uh, a, a vertical continuous field. Um, 
That, all of these things together then give us a very nice compatibility such that if you take a lot of the continuous relations, uh, then they mimic um, the discrete versions mimic those continuous versions. That's why it's called a mimetic scheme. This is just another way of representing it, but uh, looking at it through 2D here. So just a reminder, we have velocities in, in our flux vectors, pressure and density in our volume integrated scalars, and potential temperature and moisture are, are point-wise scalars in this, in this vertical space. Right, I'm going to skip over this a little bit. In fact, I will skip over it completely. We can come back to it if we want to later on. Uh, right, so very briefly here, um, revisit, revisiting these governing equations, I, I highlighted a couple then uh, of, of terms. There's the, the subgrid forcings on the right and the transport terms. The key thing here in what we're doing in Gung Ho um, is that we're actually, rather than using those mixed finite elements for all of these terms, for some we're doing something different. So in our subgrid physics terms, we want to keep the same UM code and science. We don't have to rewrite that at this time. We might do in the future, but for the time being, we want to keep it the same because we haven't got time to go through and rewrite it, and we think it's pretty good anyway, as it is. So those we retain in a finite difference form. And then we have a coupling uh, to the finite elements that uh, uh, lets them talk to one another. Similarly, for our, our transport terms, we use a finite volume representation. And the reason for doing this is that if we use lowest order finite elements, it's just not accurate enough. So what we're doing is we can use a higher order finite volume representation for our transport and that gives us back uh, the accuracy we need. And again, we can couple those to the finite element form. If we were to use a higher order representation for, finite, for the finite elements, then we might think again about that. But for the time being, we were using the lowest order, and partly because that makes it very easy to use uh, these finite difference physics terms. So just a re reminder, though, the, these uh, subgrid forcings are taken directly from the UM code. Um, and interfaced directly to the to Elfric. For the transport, we actually, uh, again, I refer you back to Nigel for some details about uh, Lagrangian, semi-Lagrangian, and, and Eulerian schemes. But the key thing here that we're going to be doing is we split this up into horizontal and vertical parts. Um, so our grid is, is horizontally unstructured, but in the vertical, it's very easy. Everything's in a column, and we can do things quite cheaply locally. You also have very different features between horizontal motions and vertical motions. Um, so it makes sense to split those in some respect. But, uh, but the, the things that we're putting in are, uh, are split into those two categories. Um, in terms of horizontal, then, for transport, I, I, I will go through this because I think it's probably quite important to... Uh, transport's quite important for for chemistries and aerosol, um, we have multiple options. And we're, we're, we're developing multiple options at the time being because we don't know which one will ultimately be the most efficient. The first is, if we imagine moving this grid box across with a, a current number of three, we're going across three cells. If we think about an Eulerian scheme, and this is what we're introducing, if we want to be able to cope with a large current number, then we can do that either by having multiple stages or multiple substeps, And so that's what we do. We have a, a system that will use both of those. We can have a runga cutter scheme and a, a multiple substep uh, um, application of that scheme. This then uses a, a relatively small uh, stencil, so halo size, on each substep, but they add up into three. So we, we have to do three times. We have to do three halo exchanges, communications with the neighboring uh, partitions. Um, but they're all very small halo exchanges. So we're, doing, we're moving a small amount of data, but we're doing it three times. And the computation itself for the Eulerian scheme is relatively cheap. The other form that we're developing is called a flux form semi-Lagrangian scheme. And this looks very similar to a, a traditional semi-Lagrangian, except that it's, it's conservative, it's flux form. Um, and this does things in one big go. 
So we'd look back three grid cells. So we'd have a halo around our partition of size three and we'd bring all of that information across. So that only has to do one communication with its neighbors, but it's more expensive. It's a larger, uh, um, larger uh, amount of data that we're transferring in one go. And the computation itself is a little bit more expensive. So as I say, we don't really know which one of these is going to be optimal uh, for, our, for the architectures we're going to be get, getting, and we're developing both of them for the time being. Uh, and op both options uh, are available. Right, very quick summary of the differences and similarities. So in, uh, on the left-hand side, you've got uh, Endgame and the UM. So uh, on the right-hand side is Gunco and Elfric. Recap, we're changing the grid. The equation set is pretty much staying the same. The prognostic variables are staying the same, except that we're, rather than having separate zonal meridional winds, we now combine into a, a full 3D uh, uh, vector. Um, moist variables in the UM, we have specific humidities or mixing ratios. We're only going to be dealing with mixing ratios in Elfric. That's the plan anyway. We don't want to have to port across specific humidities. Um, what, what else is important here? The physics parameterizations are still, still staying the same. So UM, Socrates, Joules, UKCA, the interfaces are the same as they are for the UM. So we can pick all of those up. Right, I think I've got enough time just to do this very quickly and go into some code here. So what, what I said before was our initial motivation was about the dynamical core, about doing something different, but it was recognized that the computers of the future would be a major challenge. How do we very easily move from one to another? And the way that we're doing that is to use what's referred to as a separation of concerns. So what we're trying to do is separate what we think of as science, what we think about writing algorithms, writing um, equations, from the application of those to the computer. So what we think about how we determine where the data goes, how we determine you know, in what order to put our loops, things like that. The, the directives that we need to tell the compiler for various different reasons. And the way that we are overcoming this problem then is to have some code automation, automa autom automatic code generation. So a scientist, and I'll use the term loosely scientist, it's not, a, it's not a pigeonhole, but if you're coming in to write some equations, you come in and you write an algorithm and you write what we call a kernel. And then in the middle, something called Cyclone, which has been developed by SDSC, looks at your code, it, it, passes the code, and it writes a new layer in between to determine how you're going to unpack your data and how you're going to send it off uh, to, the, to the computer. This is easiest shown with a, a few, few demonstrations here, I think. Um, so an algorithm, I refer to here, works on an arbitrary field, a full domain field. We don't have to say it's uh, indexed from I, J, K, from one to 10, whatever. We just say we want theta. And we want, to do, we want to add theta to rho, let's say. Why you do that, I don't know. But, um, but we don't say we add theta array index plus theta rho array index, et cetera, et cetera. And that that's, uh, look, looks like this on the right hand, le the left hand side here, sorry. So all of these things we're talking about here, pressure, x, now this is real code, by the way, that uh, has Ian Bootle's pulled out. Um, Pressure uh, is just referred to here. Xna, W theta, that's a, another version of our, our pressure. We put these into this, this left-hand side. And we have what's called a magic invoke. This thing is our DSL, our, our uh, domain-specific language, essentially. And the key thing is that Cyclone knows that it means something special. Um, our kernels, on the other hand, we say, well, if we want to do something, so let's, uh, for example, um, uh, in this case, I want to do something on the, uh, copy something from Exner to something in, in that I'll pass through to the, the UM physics. It's a column of data. And here I do loop. I say, well, actually, I'm going to loop over a layer to do this. So I'm just going to loop over my layer 
and I'm going to uh, pop this into this, this, this thing on this, this left-hand side. We can directly loop over the k-dimension. That's no problem. So the way our data is set up, we can just loop over a, 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 a vertical. But in the horizontal, because we're now unstructured, we don't have the nice structure of the lat-long grid, then we have to have an indirection map. And this indirection map then uh, we, we, we is pulled out somewhere in the middle uh, for us to be able to use in the kernel. Um, so Cyclone then ought to generate some code that sits between the algorithm and the kernel. It will deal with things like uh, halo exchanges, it will deal with OpenMP, uh, looping, various things like that, and it will pull out the right bits of code that we need. It will do halo exchanges when we need to do halo exchanges, communications with the neighboring cells. It will only do that if we need to. Um, and the way that it knows to do this is a little bit of metadata that we add into the kernels. So this is, if you, you'll requ recall that we have different spaces, so I just tell, when I'm writing this kernel, I just tell the, the code, the, the cyclone, that I want to use a field which is in our W theta space. And in fact, I'm using two fields from the W theta space. And I'm only just going to operate on a column of data. The key thing about this is that it knows that W theta is horizontally discontinuous and vertically continuous. So that it knows that if it operates on a particular column, then it's not going to update, need to update the column next to it because they're discontinuous. If this was to be, be our, our space where we have the, the wind in it, our W2 space, then Cyclone would know that we've got a shared face there and we need to do something special and careful whether that means communications or doing com computation in, in a particular order to prevent race conditions. But it knows this from this information that it's got here. And then this is what it generates. I don't know how well you can see this, but so this is the original code that we've got on here. We've got, we put in this invoke. It rewrites this to call an invoke zero. That's what it, it does, and it passes these things through. But then within this new layer of code, it calls our routine that we want to do, but it also adds in all of these other things. So it adds in MPI directives, so it does a, a halo exchange. It loops across the horizontal uh, in our unstructured domain. And in this case, it also does something called coloring, which prevents the, uh, the race conditions. So if you're using OpenMP, it'll make sure it doesn't operate, both two threads don't operate on the same column at the same time. Um, and it'll add in more OpenMP, uh, etc. I'm afraid I haven't got a huge amount of time to go into this, but if you want to go in a bit more later on, then please do ask. I, I'll skip on that. So very briefly, I think I've probably reached my time I'm a bit now. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll just give you a, a very brief look at our current status and our current plans. So this is our timeline that we have to get all of these things working. So the key thing is, I guess, this arrow represents where we are now. So all of these things to the left, we should already have done, and, I, and I'm glad to say that we have. So what, what this is is a, a proto-GAL. So this is a pro proto-global atmosphere model. Uh, and we've got something now. So we have all of this up and running with the physics, um, and it's going through assessment for NWP and climate uh, metrics, etc., And it looks pretty much like uh, the f what you'd see for, for the UM in terms of its functionality. Uh, and then we have a basic RAL, so this is a basic regional model. So this is some way behind, so you see there's a, a proto-RAL due this month as well, but the, the, uh, the regional models, so far we, we're just doing some testing with the boundary conditions, um, but we're starting to do some actual runs that look like a proper regional model as well. And then looking forward to the future, um, the, the idea is that we should sort of get a frozen GC6, so our, our configuration, a couple of configuration six, sometime in 24, 25, and we'll be looking to implement things uh, in our parallel suites 
So we, at the Met Office, we run things in, a, in, a, in parallel to the main operational forecast before switching over, and then we should be operational from around uh, 26, 27. I'll just flick up some little plots here. So this is a, uh, I don't even know which field this is that, that we've got in here. Uh, this is the, up, the top of atmosphere flux uh, from a, a C448 run, so a 20 kilometer simulation. Uh, nothing particularly I wanted to pull out from this other than it, it runs. Um, we've got some climate assessments. Uh, so actually some things look better than the UM in, in some respects, so some of the improvements in the surface moisture, but equally some things look different, such as uh, the jets uh, are slightly different, but we've got a, a period now of, of a year or two to really start to refine some of the science in these. And as I mentioned, we've got um, some regional uh, forecasts now running, so these are uh, one and a half kilometre um, runs over the UK and the left is the UM, right is, is Elfric, and things are looking pretty okay. Um, we're also doing some very high resolution stuff. Um, it, so, in particular, comparing our cloud resolving model against Elfric. So, looking at dry, idealized boundary uh, layers, etc. And, and things are looking fairly reason, reasonable there. Um, I'm going to skip on down to my very last slide now, though. Oops, gone too far. And I'll just leave this up. But effectively, this should tell you what's what's changing and what's staying the same. Um, as you're going through your tutorials this week, working with the UM, a lot of what you're doing should be fairly seamless uh, when it comes to Elfric. Um, but there will be certain things that, uh, that will be different. But any questions then now, I think? Um, we actually answered the question that we had yesterday on it, time stepping in the UN. Yes, so I, I, I obviously skipped over an awful lot here, but um, the, the key things that we're doing here are you, by using the lowest order finite elements is, makes everything very quite straightforward because if you think about the way that the degrees of freedom of our finite elements are arranged, um, so where the coefficients of our polynomials sit, they're, they're in exactly the same arrangement as we have for our C staggering and our Charlie Phillips. So the UM is already working on finite differences in the physics that look very similar to that. So certainly for things like potential temperature, if you get an increment from the, the physics scheme for potential temperature, it, it's in the same space, essentially. Finite differences and finite elements look the same. It's where it becomes harder is, is mainly for the winds. And that's for two, two reasons. One, one being um, uh, the, the arrangement is slightly different. Um, actually, that's not true. It, 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 so a lot of the physics schemes work on columns where you uh, average the UM winds to the centers. And, and I think what I'm saying here is actually those are zonal averages and meridional averages, and they're very straightforward to do. So we, we need to do a sampling, and we need to rotate those winds then for the physics to use, because they have to be in the right directions. And then you have to map back again and do similar rotations. So th there's not a lot of interpolation going on, but there, that's the, the winds are the, where it gets a little bit complicated and you have to do a little bit of extra work. Two questions. Um, one's just occurred to me that you mentioned that the original modeling, maybe the current UM is some complex rotating force type of step. So is this sort of covering that many of the things to do? I'd like to say yes, but I don't think it, it makes it easy. So wh what we are doing, so, so we, the finite elements themselves, 
and the, the gung-ho formulation. I mean, we can do whatever we like with this, this domain, the, the regional domain. It doesn't have to be a lat long domain. It could be any kind of stretching. It could be a panel of the cube sphere. But we're choosing to do things exactly the same as the UM because it's, it's easier at this point um, to keep things in the same uh, for post-processing for all sorts of reasons like that. Um, so we are doing the same rotations as we do in the UM now. Um, you can do other things if you like. The, the, the key thing that I haven't maybe specified here is that in LFRIC we don't have an inherent coordinate. We have an inherent coordinate system, but we don't have an inherent mesh within the model. We read a mesh in. And as long as that mesh has got quadrilaterals rather than triangles or something like that, then it, it can be any kind of mesh you want. So you just you have to create a mesh and then you can run it. So th there's, th in that respect, it's, there's no constraint over rotated poles, etc. Uh, again, again, there's no. You can do whatever you like. You can rotate it. You can stretch it. Whatever you like, for the dynamical core itself. Um, it's mainly down for post-processing applications for data assimilation, where we're saying let's fix to this particular cubed sphere, um, so that downstream. But if you're just running the atmosphere model on your own, without having to worry about all of those other things, and you can plot the data then you can stretch it, you can move those points around, um, you can do all sorts of things if you want to. It's ancillary generation, things like that where it becomes complicated. But. One more question. Yeah, sorry, I, I wanted to highlight that a little bit more and I, I didn't. Um, so the, when we were putting out specifications for what we were de developing for GUNCO, the only scientific requirement we had, rather than all of the dr software drivers, was around conserva local conservation of transport. So that's why we're using flux form schemes, because we want to have local conservation. So we have options for advective form and flux form, but by and large, um, we will be using the flux form for moisture and dry density. So those will be locally conservative schemes. And then you can use exactly the same for traces and for aerosol, um, aerosols, chemical species, whichever you like. Uh, so those will have local conservation properties. And that, I think, will be quite a, a useful scientific uh, development. Um, no, for end game, it is not a con locally conservative scheme. So for a semi-Lagrangian, point-wise semi-Lagrangian scheme as, as, such as we have now, there is no guarantee you have conservation. So only if you have you know, certain requirements like constant wind will you get a conserved quantity as you're moving across um, from one place to another. So Endgame doesn't have local conservation. What Endgame does instead is it has a fixer at the end of each iteration of the transport. So it does a global fix to make sure the global uh, field is conserved. And that is done in a, in a targeted way, so it's not just adding it on everywhere, but it doesn't have that inherent local conservation, which Gunko and Alfred will do. Yeah. 